Hey, good morning. I want to thank you for joining me, and um, hopefully you're staying dry, and thoughts and prayers um, in all sincerity are going out to all those impacted by the storms and everything we've been going through in recent days. It's good to have rain, but it's also been challenging. So, um, so anyways, thank you for joining me. Um, one thing I would mentioned, we've been for the last couple of years kind of pre-recording the messages ahead of time um, so that we could edit them, have them available uh, for you anytime during the morning. And, um, but we're kind of making a shift within the next week or two. Um, we're going to be live streaming the first service. We have two services, one at 9 o'clock, the other at 1030. And we'll live stream it so you can join in and watch um, after uh, 9 o'clock on. Um, sometime in there it'll become available when we switch over to the message part. Um, or you can, it'll immediately be available um, as soon as we finish the first service. It'll be available online for you able to watch as well. And so um, you lose a little bit of the um, convenience of being able to watch it, you know, before 9 o'clock. At um, the same time, it's a little more consistent with what we're doing on Sunday mornings and keeps us from having to record it ahead of time. So just make a note of that. That'll happen within the next couple of weeks, and we'll communicate that on the website as well. And so um, I don't know how many times you've been flying or the longest trip you've ever taken. The longest trip I've ever taken, I've actually taken it three times, and it's to the Philippines. And getting to the Philippines is not without a layover along the way. And it's a really long, not counting the layover part, it's about 15 and a half hours of flight time, which is a really, really, really long time. And, um, but I, I've thought, I was thinking about this week is, can you imagine getting ready to go on a 15 hour flight and deciding that you probably don't need to fill up on gas? You know, that you got gas a while back, you should be fine until you get there, the gas you have should be fine. And so you just said, hey, let's just take it off. I think we can make it. And, and to do that would be incredibly irresponsible and flat out dangerous, not just for you, but for anybody else that's on that flight. And in a similar way, it's somewhat irresponsible and not helpful to us nor others to not think about filling up our, our being filled with the presence and the goodness of God. You know, one of those ideas of just we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, but the other part is are we consistent about filling ourselves up, filling up our tank on a consistent basis? And sometimes we're like kind of, you know, twice in my life I've run out of gas when I was driving, not, not flying, but driving. And, and both times it, it, there were gas stations along the way. I just pushed it. I thought I could get further. I didn't want to stop. It was inconvenient. And I think that sometimes people kind of approach time in God's presence that way as well, is that, oh, I can get by and we just get busy with life and distracted and we feel like we don't have time. And as a result, we're kind of running on fumes and it's not good for us nor the people that we want to reach for the sake of Christ. And so we, we started a series last week called Outflow. It's based on what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 15, verse 13. It says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't know if you caught that, but you know, it says, May the God of hope fill you, and then it goes on to say, May you overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, it's as we immerse ourselves, you know, God is omnipresent. And when we accept, receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, then the Spirit comes to dwell in us. But there's this sense that the hope of the Holy Spirit should also overflow out of us. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus said, When my Spirit comes on you, you will be my witnesses. So as you are filled with the Spirit, there is an outflow of that. And, and you shall be my witnesses. And so this idea of being filled with the Spirit and, um, and witnessing flowing out of us should go hand in hand. And uh, sadly, though, I read a statistic over the last week that was really concerning to me. Lifeway Research found that only three in 10 unchurched Americans say they have ever had a Christian share with them how to be saved. I'll say that again, only three out of 10 unchurched Americans say that at any point there's another Christian who shared with them how to be saved. You know, I don't know how we expect people to be saved if, um, if that small number are ever actually hearing from Christians how to be saved, if they're never hearing the gospel. Paul talked about this when he said, um, he said how will they know if they have not heard, and how are they going to hear if nobody tells them, if nobody preaches? It's our responsibility on some level to get out there. And so I was thinking a little bit, what are the reasons why people don't share more often? Why, you know, I've also read before that only 5% of Christians ever lead anybody to Christ over the course of their lifetime. And I think, why is that number so low? And it's not just out of resistance from people, 
but sometimes it's a, a lack of intentionality on our part sharing. And I know that sometimes it may be that it's outside our, you know, people's comfort zone to talk to other people about Christ, or sometimes maybe people feel um, inadequate or not really prepared. But I think on some level, some of it comes back to this idea of overflowing that, that as you're filled with God's Spirit, that you will be witnesses. It doesn't say you should. It just comes a lot more natural. And um, I was thinking about, you know, I remember um, in youth ministry, and you've maybe seen this game as well. We used to do a game every once in a while where you'd have a, you know, a relay game with different lines of students. And on one end, you'd have a bucket and the other full of water. And the other end of the students, you would, a line of students, you would have another bucket that's completely empty. And then every one of the students in between those two buckets would have an empty cup. And when you said go, the goal was the fir first person closest to the bucket of, of, of water would scoop in there, fill up water, and pour it in the next person's glass, and then go on, they keep passing it forward, and they just keep this process going over and over and over, and the goal is to see who could, you know, fill up their bucket with the most amount of water within the allotted time. And I thought that's kind of a little bit like how it is with evangelism, that, that you can't really fill up anybody else's cup unless your cup also is filled with water. But there's this idea that we fill, we're filled with the Holy Spirit, and then we pass it on to others who pass it on and pass it on and pass it on. And that's the goal. But it always begins with, at some point, having your cup filled. And that's kind of the image I want us to think about this morning in this series, is that idea of being filled with God's presence. And so this morning, you know, rather than focusing as much on evangelism, I want to go back to the foundation, and that's our own relationship with God. I want us to think about our own relationship with God, and, and I want us to think about, you know, what, what are some specific ways that we can fill our cup, so to speak. And, um, and so the first point this morning, really just kind of the basis of this, I think it's important to understand that there's nothing God wants more for you than a close relationship with him. There's nothing that God wants for you more than for you to have a close relationship with him. Out of all the different blessings, all the different things, the one thing that I really believe that God wants most for each and every one of us is to have not just to be saved, but also to have a close personal relationship with God. A lot of times people say, God wants more than anything for you to be saved. And yeah, that's it, but that's not an end. And, you know, is that it's a means to an end to live in close fellowship with God. It's not just about getting us into heaven. It's about getting us into fellowship. Blaise Pascal said this. He said, there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God the Creator, made known through Jesus Christ. He says there's a God-shaped vacuum inside each one of us, and that vacuum can only be filled by God. And whether we recognize it or not, we are created for fellowship with God. And if we're not living in fellowship with God, then there's this missing piece of our life. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Jesus said, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. So I've shared this, you know, a few years back I shared it, and I think about it more around Christmas time, and maybe you remember me sharing this before, but when I was in junior high, I went to, um, our, our church was in Pismo Beach, it was Grover Beach actually, technically at the time, and around Christmas time, um, leading up to that, our leaders said, hey, let's get a float for the, for the parade, you know, for this Christmas parade that happens on Grand Avenue, and we thought, oh, that sounds so cool, and so we brainstormed ideas, and and so we settled on this idea. We had a flatbed truck. And, and what we did is we said we had a Christmas tree and a bunch of other students that were sitting around and they were singing Christmas carols and they're in their pajamas and, and they had presents and they looked like they're having a great time. So we had all this kind of set up there. And then there's this door. And then on the other side, I was chosen to be in the role of Jesus. So I was dressed like Jesus in a robe. And my role, you know, during that time was just to stand on the other side of the door and just to knock and knock and knock. And then the side of the truck, it said, is there room for Christ in your Christmas? Is there room for Christ in your Christmas? Pretty cool. We even took second place in the parade. I thought that was awesome. You know, but this idea, is there room for Christ in your Christmas? And, and I remember at first when we started, I thought, that's so cool. I get to be Jesus. That's the most important part of the float. That's the most important thing is being Jesus. But as we're going along and I was doing this, you know, for a while, and they were all having fun, I realized I felt isolated and I got tired. I was doing this or switching hands and... It's just dragging. For a minute, I actually understood what that's like for, for, for Jesus, for God just to be constantly knocking on the door of our life. And he doesn't break through. He doesn't force himself. 
He just continues to knock and says, if you just open the door, I will come in and I will have fellowship with you. God wants more than anything to have a close relationship with us, not just to get us in heaven, but to, to have fellowship with us. In fact, a lot of times, probably most of the times you've heard that verse, you know, that I just read from, you know, Revelation 3.20, usually it's used within the context of presenting an opportunity for people to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. You know, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens the door, I will come in and have fellowship with him. And so we kind of frame it as though it's inviting people to be saved. And while there's certainly biblical truth to that, you have to keep in mind that, that Jesus spoke those words to a church. Jesus spoke those words not to a bunch of pagans outside the church, but he, he spoke those words to a church that had been drifting in terms of their fellowship with him. And, and so can you imagine Jesus saying to Christians, to a church, saying, if you would just, you know, I'm standing at the door and knocking, and just would you just let me in so I can come in and have fellowship with you? I think how crazy it is to, as Christians, you know, for, for Jesus to have to keep knocking because he's not really part of our life. We're not really living in fellowship with him. You know, in terms of that idea of inviting Jesus in, I think sometimes we're not a great host sometimes. I mean, we're not always a great host. I mean, think of it this way. Can you inviting, imagine um, somebody inviting you to come to a dinner or, or to a party, and, and so you're excited, it's so cool, they invited me over for dinner, and then you show up for dinner, and you're, you're there, you're already to eat with them, but the entire night goes by, and they've hardly even said three words to you the whole night. The very person that invited you to come to dinner just gets so busy with everybody else and everything else going on that the night goes by and they've hardly even spoken to you. You think, man, that is so incredibly rude. But I wonder how many times, even as Christians, people invite Jesus to come in and to be their savior. They invite him in, but then they get busy and distracted and don't really, they're not a good host, don't spend time in fellowship with Jesus. And I don't know if that sounds like you at all this morning, where it's like, well, I've invited him in, but yes, are you being a good host? Are you living in fellowship with him? I think about the Westminster Catechism. Um, it says the chief aim or the chief purpose of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. The chief aim of man is two things, what we're all about. Glorify God, enjoy him forever. And I have to confess, in my lives, there have been times where I have been so focused on trying to glorify God that I forget sometimes to just enjoy Him. So busy doing good and godly things, even in the name of Jesus, that we're not really spending time in the presence of Jesus. We're not enjoying God. And I would say if we continue to try and do things to glorify God, but we're not really enjoying fellowship with Him, at some point we will not enjoy doing those things for God. You know, it'll become just, you know, acts or tasks that we carry out because we think we're supposed to, but it doesn't overflow out of us. And the truth of the matter is, I'm not sure anything glorifies God as much as when we just want to hang out with him. Hey, you know, that's the picture we have. You know, a classic example of this is found in Luke chapter 10, verse 38 to 42. And it says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. He, she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. Or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. So here's Mary and Martha, and I, I think at different points in our lives we may resemble Martha more than we do Mary, but Martha, with good intentions even, is, it says that she was busy with all the distractions. She was going around doing what were essentially were good things, but sometimes it's good things that keep us from the best thing, from the, you know, the best, the good things. You know, it's not always sin in our lives that keep us from sitting at the feet of Jesus, Sometimes it's, it's family times, it's recreation, it's time with friends, it's rest, it's all those things that are God-given and pleasing to God, but we fill our lives so much with that and we neglect to sit at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus told Martha, said, Mary's chosen the better option, and it's not going to be taken from her. She made the right choice. You know, and, and so we need to understand how much God desires fellowship for us just to sit at the feet of Jesus and listen. J.J. Packer once said this. He said, what are we made for? To know God. 
What aim should we live in li- have in life? To know God. What is the best thing in life? To know God. It's all about knowing God, not just knowing about God, but truly knowing God. You know, recently um, we, we started a new year, and I think a lot of times people make New Year's resolutions. And a lot of those resolutions, as we shared a couple weeks ago, are centered or focused around being in shape, getting in shape and health and fitness, and I'm going to exercise more, I'm going to walk more, I'm going to do that. But there's no plan. Just I'm going to do more. Say, well, what's your plan? Well, I don't really have a plan, but I'm going to do more. And just kind of wing it. And and so inevitably, you know, it just doesn't happen. The follow through is not there. And I think the main reason that we don't follow through is just it still requires discipline and time. We want the results of of, of fitness without actually doing the, the work of fitness. You know, in Scripture it says that we should discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness. You know, and so we don't do things just out of discipline or, or to check some box to say that we did it. You know, we do it so, so we love the Lord God and so that we love others more as well. You know, I think a lot of Christians sometimes would say that they want a vibrant, intimate relationship with God, but they're unwilling to put in the time required to really nurture an intimate relationship with God. You cannot microwave relationships. There's no fast track to relationships. I, I remember my boys talking during COVID, how challenging it was to build relationships at school just over COVID. You know, at best they could maintain relationships, but they couldn't really push those relationships further along without spending time together. And the same is true in our relationship with God, is that you can't microwave or speed up a relationship with God. It comes from time and God's presence. You know, and my question this morning is, are you willing to invest the time? And it is an investment Are you willing to invest the time needed in order to really nurture your relationship with God, in order to have a close relationship with God? I remember a number of years ago when I was youth pastoring, and I think we were at a camp or somewhere, but somebody said something that really stuck with me. They said, right now you're as close to God as you choose to be. Right now you're as close to God as you choose to be. You know, think about that. Are you, um, right now, are you content with how close you are to God? Are you content with how close? Sometimes, well, I like to be really close, but right now it's, it's really a matter of, of, of how close do you choose to be in relationship with God. James 4.8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. That's a promise. Jeremiah 29 verse 3 says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Once again, that's a promise. God says, if you draw to me, if you really seek me with all, your whole heart, I will draw near to you. You know, I will be available. I will come in and have fellowship with you. So my question this morning is, is what are you doing to draw near to God? Is he just kind of along for the ride? You know, what are you doing? To, are you really seeking God with your whole heart? You know, it, it's not wrong, by the way, you know, to have a, a, a full or busy life. You know, in fact, what Martha doing wasn't inerrantly wrong, you know, to, to, to be doing some of the preparations, but... You know, we can't let those things become an excuse or a crutch for not really sitting at the feet of Jesus. Think about this. Who is busier than Jesus? You know, Jesus was really, every time he turned around, there's a crowd of people that wanted something from him. Jesus had a busy, full life. But we also read in Scripture that Jesus often withdrew to lonely places to spend time in prayer. You know, and the busier our life it becomes, the more we need to sit at the feet of Jesus and fill up our tank. You know, this morning I want to suggest four specific ways to just fill up the tank. And and there's more ways than this, but I chose to focus on four. And let me say this, especially to those of you who are watching online, is that I know for a variety of different reasons that some of the things I'm going to share aren't as easy for you to do, maybe because physical reasons, health reasons, just you're a place in life right now where you're not getting out as much as you once did for a variety of different reasons. Totally get that. No shame at all. I'm so glad that we're able to provide what we do online. We even have some Bible studies that are are Zoom. And so no shame in that. And so with that disclaimer, though, I want to share what I believe are four biblical ways to fill up our tank. And and the first thing is this, just talk to God throughout the day. Just talk to God throughout the day. I call this Fitbit prayers. Fitbit prayers. Kind of even before they had Fitbits, they had pedometers. I think that's what they're called. Pedometers where people would get these things and they'd wear them almost like a watch or whatever, and count the number of steps you had every day. And then Fitbits kind of came along and, and became even a better, more accurate way to track, you know, your number of steps and a variety of different things. And, um, and, and so the whole premise of it, and the goal was essentially to, to get 
I just remember you're supposed to get 10,000 steps a day. And so for people that even if they didn't block out, you know, a half an hour, an hour to, to break a sweat and exercise, they would try and become more intentional about walking and moving over the course of the day. So they'd park further away, you know, than they normally do, or they'd walk, take the stairs rather than the elevators. Just they would incorporate it into their lives over the course of the day. You know, and, and I love this, you know, where, where it says in 1 Thessalonians, Rejo rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So in other words, rejoice always, pray continually, Fitbit prayers. It's just over the course of the day, yes, it's great. If you want to block off an hour, half an hour and spend time in prayer, then that is awesome. But another way to feel close to God and connected to God over the course of the day is just to talk to him throughout the day. Just to direct your thoughts there. He says, rejoice always, give thanks always in all circumstances. What would happen if over the course of the day, just as you go through your day, you, you give God thanks for the circumstances and the things that happen over the course of your day, or you thank God for different people, or you thank Him for His blessings, you thank Him for His presence. It's just, if you're continually praising Him and thanking Him all day, I think it'd make a difference. There's a guy, Meister Eckhart, who said this. He said, if the only prayer you ever say in your whole life is thank you, that would suffice. Just say thank you. You know, that's, that's a really good prayer. Or what if throughout the day you just talk to God? And not even have to be long conversations, but just short statements over the course of the day where you just include them in your life. It's a great way to just draw near to God. And, and, and I believe that God begins to fill our cup, fill our lives with his presence over the course of the day. Second thing, make a weekly worship service part of your holy habits. Make a weekly worship service part of your holy habits. And once again, I know that you may or may not be able to, to join us or join together with other people consistently, but just worshiping God you know, is important. And if you can do it with other people, then that's even better. In Psalm chapter 34, verse 3, it says, Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. There's this idea of communal worship, of praising God together, that there's something powerful about as we set our hearts and minds on worshiping God, you know, that, that in the process, you know, he fills us with his presence in a different kind of way. You know, it's interesting, though, while 63% of Americans identify themselves as Christians, only 38% of Americans say they attend a weekly religious service. 63% say that they're a Christian, but only 38% are involved in a weekly worship service. In case you're curious, the numbers are worse for younger people. 60% of people that are six, 65 years or older say that they're involved in a weekly service. But of those who are 18 to 30, only 28% are involved in a weekly worship service. 60%, 28%. So we're increasingly more and more having generations that come up that desire faith without fellowship. I believe in God. I can just do it without, you know, coming together with other believers. And I don't think that's a healthy way to go about things. And COVID certainly took its toll on the number of people who attend church on a consistent basis. You know, I was, you know, reading this last week that, um, that only about 60% of people who were attending church before COVID, you know, are, have come back to churches. Only about 60% church worship services in the United States are down by about 60% over, you know, since the beginning of COVID. Um, you know, I, I love that God is available to us anytime and anywhere. And I'm glad that we're provide, able to provide a lot of different avenues for people to be able to worship God and take in God's word and learn. But but I also believe there's something really good and godly about joining together and worshiping God together. In Psalm chapter 22, verse 3, it says that God inhabits the praises of his people. You know, and he, he inhabits. Other translation says he dwells. He makes his home where people praise him. And so there's something significant about praising God together. You know, David Jeremiah said this. He said, if you don't worship, you'll never experience God. If you don't worship, you'll never experience God. I think the interesting and maybe even ironic thing about worship is that while worship is really expressing gratitude um, to God, it's about glorifying God, it's, it's saying our hearts and minds on God, is that the truth of the matter is that God doesn't need our worship as much as we need to worship Him. That's the crazy thing is God doesn't have a massive ego. It's not like, oh, yeah, this makes me feel so good to hear people worship me. God doesn't need our worship nearly as much as we need to worship him. Because it's in the process of worshiping God, you know, that, that we draw closer to God, you know, and that we are overflowed with God's presence and his anointing and his goodness. 
The next thing, the third thing, get involved in a growth group. Get involved in a growth group. You know, it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. You know, growth groups are essentially, that's our version of small group Bible studies. And rather than calling them small groups, which focuses on the size of the group, we call them growth groups, which focuses on the purpose of our groups, which is to grow in our relationship with God and grow in our relationship with others. <clears throat> and I believe that one of the best ways to grow in our relationship with God and grow in our relationship with others is to be involved in a growth group. And, and like I said, you know, we even have growth groups that are available online. If you can't be here, you know, we have some of those that are offered as well. You know, and um, in, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, it says, Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Let us not get out of the habit of coming together, he says. Let's not give up that habit. It's interesting. I, I read before that it takes two weeks to fall out of a habit and five weeks to develop a habit. Five weeks to develop a habit and only two weeks to fall out of a habit. You know, and so we have this habit of time in God's presence and with God's people, and then we have this habit of being involved in, 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 in groups. But, boy, we can fall out of that really, really quickly. You know, it's interesting. It, it says we should be coming together even more as the day draws near. You know, but instead, it seems like in churches, we're going opposite. Rather than coming together more for the purposes of encouragement, we're coming together less. You know, if you're my age or older, you probably remember, if you grew up in the church, I remember, you know, we'd have Sunday school on Sunday mornings, and we'd have worship service on Sunday mornings. And then, you know, a lot of people come back for another service in the evening, and then, then a lot of people are involved in small groups over the course of the week. You know, and now it, it, we're doing pretty good if we have people to come for an hour a week. You know, and, and then what happens is people keep going from church to church to church to church because they don't feel connected and they're not growing enough in their relationships. And, they, and, and I don't know that we can feel the sense of connectedness if we're not involved in some kind of community group together. You know, even before COVID, the percentage of people involved in a small group was in decline. But the impact of COVID on small group participation is undeniable. And I would say in our church that we were able to keep going pretty well with our worship services more than we were with our small groups. You know, we're still trying to put that back together. And some people who've been able to lead them before, kind of aged out, aren't anymore. We need more people to lead, lead groups as well. And, but I was reading this, this this week. Just prior to COVID in 2020, 59% of the American churchgoers said they participated in small group. So only almost 60%. Still not great. There's still over 40% of those who go to church that weren't involved in a small group. But, but that number was a 59%. But, with, but within a year, but this number dropped to 37% in 2021. Went from 59% to 37%. 22% of, you know, drop in that. Um, and, and while some, some people have returned to a small group, there's others that still have not found their way back. You know, um, it's interesting. A lot of times we measure the success of a church by its worship services. And I think about Rick Warren, who pastored for a number of years, pastored Saddleback Church down in Orange County, and it grew like crazy. Massively large mega church reaching thousands of people, and, and lots of people come to worship services. But in many ways, to Rick Warren, it wasn't uh, as important. He didn't measure the success, success by the size of their worship services. Listen to what he said about their small groups. He said, the New Testament model for a healthy church is large group worship and small group fellowship. Small groups are the purest expression of the church. I'm preaching this constantly. You've got to be in a group. You're not really a part of this church unless you're in a group. Small groups are where believers become belongers. I like that. Small groups are where believers become belongers. And once again, no shame if you can't find your way out for medical reasons or other things like that. But if there is any other way to join together with others in a small group, I just want to encourage you to, as we begin 2023, you're thinking about your holy habits, then maybe this is the time to do that. You know, and, and so I just encourage you, we've got a lot of different growth groups. They're all provided on the, on the website. You can go on and see what's offered a variety of different times. I even lead one on Thursdays. Absolutely love that group. Uh, one of the highlights of my week. The other thing I'd say this is we still need people to lead growth groups as well. So if you're interested in that, let me know. The fourth and the final thing, the last thing this morning that I believe can help us grow in our relationship with the Lord. And you don't even have to be around other people to do this last thing. Is just read your Bible on your own every week. Read your Bible on your own every week. 
Sounds basic, it sounds simple, but it's also one of the most neglected spiritual disciplines these days is just consistent time in our word. You know, and um, in Psalm 119, verse 97, David said, Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it day and night. He says, I meditate on it day and night. I meditate on it all day long. You know, and that word meditate means to chew on something, to digest something. He's, and so David didn't just say that I think about your, your, your word when I go to church for an hour a week. No, I, I think about it, I chew on it day and night, all day long. You know, and, and um, I, the people that I've seen that really have a vibrant relationship with the Lord, they are consistently in the word of God. You know, I think about it, my, my, my mom, I just remember she'd sit there on the couch and every day, you know, daily bread and doing other things like that. And same with my grandparents. And just, I, I came from a great heritage of people where spending time in God's word was so incredibly important. Charles Spurgeon once said this. He said, if you wish to know God, you must know his word. If you wish to know God, you must know his word. He's right. I don't think you can really know God, not just know about God, but to even know God apart from time in his word. You know, um, to come back to COVID again, I feel like we're still working our way out of this, not out of the physical part of it, but out of the way we do life because of it. But, um, and I know it hasn't gone away, and, and I don't know that it will anytime soon. But when COVID first hit, one of my biggest fears that I had is, is in my mind, I kept thinking, will people, will, will people in our church feed themselves? Will people in our church feed themselves? You know, if the only way they're really growing their relationship with the Lord is because they spend an hour a week at church, what's going to happen when they can't come together to, you know, to, to worship and spend time together in God's Word? Will people feed themselves, or are they dependent upon somebody else feeding them once a week? You know, and, and statistics show that I was right to be concerned. You know, it's, it's interesting. In 2021, about 50% of Americans said they read their Bible on their own. You know, at least three or four times a year. So not even like every week. About 50% of Americans say they read their Bible at least three or four times a year on their own. But in 2022, it dropped to 39%. Do you get that? You know, the number of people just not even reading every week, but reading, you know, periodically on their own went from 50% to 39% in one year. That's a massive drop. You know, in case you're wondering what those numbers are, they, they said that about 22 million Christians stopped reading the Bible over the course of that year. About 22 million people were no longer opening up the Bible on their own. I can't even imagine that. At a time where, you know, where we enter into COVID and even more than ever, we need to be able to feed ourselves, open up the Word of God, and dig it in and chew on a consistent basis. Even more so, people were neglecting it. And now I know that on some level that says something about the power of community coming together when we do come together consistently during the week, then we think about the Word of God and some of the other spiritual disciplines more during the week. And when we don't have this time together, it's easier to neglect those things. That being said, you know, we desperately need to be in the Word of God and to think in a time where we, you know, need to be feeding ourselves to neglect that, you know, it's really, really heartbreaking. In fact, John Blake lead researcher for the American Bible Society wrote these words. He said, what we discover was startling, disheartening, and disruptive. He's right. It's startling, disheartening, and disruptive. It's disheartening to think of how few Christians actually open up their Bible during the week and read on their own. You know, I've laid out this challenge before. A lot of times people say, well, I'm too busy. I have so much going on. Here's the deal. If you spent just 14 minutes a day you know, just giving God your undivided attention. Because once again, the greatest thing we can give God is our attention. If you spend just 14 minutes a day giving God your undivided attention, time in prayer, time in God's word, just 14 minutes, that would only be one one hundredth of your 24-hour day, day and night, actually. If you gave just 14 minutes, that would be one one hundredth of your 24-hour day. Don't you think that God deserves at least one one hundredth of our day? Our undivided attention, set aside to spend time in prayer and time in his word. You know, and, and I don't think that we can really grow in our relationship. It's going to be hard to be overflowing, you know, with the goodness of God and just the, the anointing of God's spirit. You know, once again, God is omnipresent. His spirit is, dwells in us. But I don't know that all those things will overflow out of us if we're not also filling up our tank on a consistent basis. 
Let me say this this morning. I've laid out, you know, four specific things to do. But I hope that you won't approach these like kind of like a spiritual to-do list. Kind of like, yeah, I, I you know, read the Bible, did that, check. You know, pray, check. You know, did I go to church yet, yeah, check. You know, is that we're not, it's not an end in itself. You know, we're doing these things not to just to know, you know, about God, but to really know Him more. To have a more intimate, passionate relationship with God. Just in conclusion, I leave you with this quote from Martin Lloyd-Jones. He said, I'm not asking whether you know things about him, but do you know God? Are you enjoying God? Is God the center of your life, the soul of your being, the source of your greatest joy? After all, he is meant to be. God is meant to be. Join me in prayer. Lord God, we come before you right now, and we thank you that you, you're just knocking on the door and wanting to have fellowship with us. And the fact that, that there's people that have taken time just to listen today says volumes about their desire to grow in their relationship with you. But may it not end during this time, God. Um, help us to, to, to invest time consistently. Help us over the course of the day for our, our, our thoughts and, and, our, and our, our prayers to be going to you consistently, Lord. And may we be more, spend more consistent time in your word, and whether it's in groups or together. Whatever it is, God, help us to really have a plan to think intentionally about how to grow in our relationship with you. With you. And as a result, Lord, we just pray that the goodness would flow out of our lives, God, and that goodness would just soften the soil in other people's hearts, and they would be receptive as we begin to talk to them about you. We pray all these things in your holy name. Amen. God bless you. May the Lord fill you up. Have a great day. Thank you.